So I guess, should we start? Should we start? Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, welcome everyone. Thanks for joining us here today at Death Dames Podcast. I am your co-host, Kimberly. And joining me in studio is... Lila Dunk. Hi, everyone. Her mic sounds much better. Yes, it does. And uh, remoting in from lovely scenic Connecticut. Yes. Ali Nemec. Hello. How are you? I'm fantastic. How are you, Kim? I'm here. <laughs> <laughs> so, yes, welcome to Death Dames Podcast. We are a true crime slash science slash history slash comedy podcast where we uh, take apart everyone's favorite true crime stories and, and really, you know, take a look at the weird science and history behind them. But, all right, great. Well, I think we're going to dive right into what made everyone happy this week. Uh, who wants to go first? Not me. Not you? Okay. Kim, can you go first? All right. Well, one thing that made me happy, um, I've actually been reading a book series that I'm really enjoying, uh, and it's it's a Singapore-based mystery series, like a murder mystery series. It's fiction. Okay. So the, the these books are written by Ovidia Yu, and the series revolves around this like older woman in Singapore who uh, she owns her own cafe, and they're called Auntie Lee's Delights. And it's really cute because it's like, she's just this like little nosy, feisty old woman widow uh, who solves crimes. <laughs> oh, it's, cute. That's yeah, it's really, it's really cute. And this, the crimes are always pretty good. And I'm usually pretty quick to figure out the twists of something just because I study a lot of real cases and I listen to mystery and or, um, I read mystery books a lot. So I'm usually pretty good at figuring out who like the murderer is and stuff. Mm -hmm. um, but she's really good with twists because there's a couple times where I was like, oh, really? I didn't even think that. So yeah, so I definitely recommend checking them out. But yeah, so that's what's made me happy. I've been really enjoying it. All right. So okay. yes, Ali, go ahead. All right. So Actually, this morning, I finally did something I said that I was going to do a long time ago and watched the second Fantastic Beasts movie, Crimes of Grindelwald, and it just okay. made me very happy because I miss Harry Potter, and it made me very happy. That was that the one with weird Johnny Depp? Yes. He looks weird. Was it good? So the first one was a whole bunch of setting up the world. Mm -hmm. okay. This one was a lot of getting the plot started. In the second one, you find out, like, how these characters interact. Oh, okay. All right, cool. Um, and then mine is just kind of silly, but I worked extra long this week at work, so I made more money. How exciting. And then my, so my really happy thing was just, this is going to sound so lame, but coming to see Kim. I looked, I've been looking forward to it for like three weeks. And yeah, that's, that's my happy thing today is that I got to come here. Boring. Oh my God, stop. It didn't have anything to do with babies. Except the fact that you worked longer with babies. Well, fine, but I didn't mention babies. I did. Okay, fine. I worked with <laughs> so babies. So this is and it was on really you, Allie. <laughs> yep. I'm gonna find a way to make everything that made Lila happy about babies. That is my singular goal in this podcast. This is what That's I'm fine. trying to get out of this podcast. That's fine. <laughs> That's good. That's good to know. Yep. Me as the supervisor and producer of this podcast. My one goal is to make everything Lila says about babies. <laughs> Perfect. Perfect. I mean, I love that. Okay. Well. Uh. Cool. Okay, so you guys ready to hear a story? Yes. Yes, please. So today's, uh, before we get into it, Allison, what is today's research topic? Today's research topic is refrigerators and how they work. Yeah, kind of a weird topic, I know. The refrigerator murderer. Um, actually. Yes? Oh so, my god, did I guess it? Now, I know last week that we definitely dug deep into history because we mm -hmm. talked about which, uh, which trials. Uh, and I know that can be a bit dry. So I'm going to make up for that with crimes that were done by an actual criminal. <gasps> uh, not, you know, somebody's a fake criminal like the witches were. Uh, and done within the past hundred years. <laughs> okay. Ooh. So uh, the research topic for you, Allison, is how refrigerators work. It's going to pretty obviously relate to the murders of Fred and Edwina Rogers which you'll see the connection relatively quickly. Okay. Uh, with that, let's get into today's story, which is the case of the Icebox murder. <gasps> I actually know this one. <sighs> okay. All right. Well, no spoilers. Then. Okay. I will. I won't say anything. Okay. On June 23rd. Is that your birthday? 21st. 22nd, oh, Kim. Wow, Kim. Continue. 
I was close, though. You said the 21st, then the 23rd. (laughs) So I got both sides of it. Oh, Kim. All right. On June 23rd, 1965, two police officers in Houston, Texas, received a call from Marvin Rogers, requesting a wellness check on his aunt and uncle. Marvin was concerned that something had happened as his phone calls to the couple went unanswered for days, which was unusual behavior for his aunt specifically. Once they had broken through the doors of the Rogers' home, police were surprised to see that nothing seemed to miss and that the house looked perfectly normal and lived in. Hmm. The only thing that they noticed that was somewhat odd was the presence of various foods sitting on the dining room table. Curious as to why, one officer opened the refrigerator and saw mounds of unwrapped meat carefully and neatly placed on the center shelves. Uh, What? (laughs) They believed that the family must have recently butchered a pig for roasting, that was, until they noticed the two human heads through the clear glass of the vegetable crispers. What? (laughs) At that moment, the police knew that the lumps of meat were not pork, but the limbs and torsos of the deceased home's occupants, Fred and Edwina Rogers. Oh my god. What? Can I say a really quick fun fact about that? An unfun fact? Sorry, it is not fun. That's true. An unfun fact about that um, is that cannibals have been said to call us long pig because we taste like pork apparently yes i've actually done research into this yes for a book i'm writing and yes it's uh, a real thing <laughs> and i hate pork which would make me a really bad cannibal <laughs> <laughs> just put a lot of salt on it you'll be fine but i was just i just had to put that in because that is really funny and ironic well and that's why too they use pigs like ballistic stomach yeah oh right right because the skin and everything is very similar we're pretty similar to yeah. pigs. yeah we are pigs pigs are we so naturally this led to a complete sweep of the house and surrounding areas but it wasn't until later that they discovered the couple's organs in a nearby sewer as they had been flushed down the toilet ew <laughs> Any other remains were never found. What? Oh, God. Okay. So they took all yeah. bones but the head? Correct. Isn't it usually the other way around? Yep. Okay. <laughs> Special circumstances. Investigation of the heads showed that Edwina had been shot in the head while Fred had been beaten to death with a claw hammer, his eyes gouged out, and his genitalia removed. Oh, isn't that sweet? Yep. Once dead. Both had been dragged to the master bathroom, drained of blood, chopped into pieces, and then placed in the refrigerator. The murder and dissection was done by someone with some knowledge of anatomy, and the home appeared to have been thoroughly cleaned, as there was little blood found anywhere in the house. The only blood they found was on the keyhole leading to a spare bedroom, the bedroom of Fred and Edwina's adult son, Charles. Oh, no. The couple had been killed on Father's Day. (gasps) That's so sad. (sighs) Charles Frederick Rogers was born on December 30th, 1921, and was the son of Fred and Edwina Rogers. Little is known for certain about his early life, but we know for certain that he attended the University of Houston, where he earned a bachelor's in nuclear physics. During World War II, Charles was a pilot with the Navy and ended up serving in the Office of Naval Intelligence. After the war, Charles worked as a seismologist for Shell Oil for nine years. For those who don't know, seismology is the scientific study of earthquakes, as well as the effect of earthquakes on the environment. He apparently had a strong talent for finding gas, oil, and gold for companies that he worked for. And he also spoke seven languages. So he made money and he was very, very like, I don't even like, what's the word? Smart. Yeah, I guess. (laughs) Talented? I mean, I would also call that talent to learn that many languages. Oh, definitely. That takes a lot. (laughs) But he still lived at home. I get into that a little bit. Okay. If you've gathered anything from this brief summary of his history, Charles Rogers was smart. Very smart. Keep that in mind. Oh, okay. I'm scared. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) Despite being at the same job for nine years, Charles suddenly quit his job in 1957 and never gave an explanation as to why. From then on, he remained unemployed, living with his parents in their home in Houston. I'd be so pissed at my kid if they had this good job 
bringing in all this money and then they just quit because they want to. This is very suspicious. He had become an extreme recluse, even to the point where it's reported that he would communicate with his parents by slipping notes under his door. Why? (laughs) Oh my God. Okay. He was so quiet, in fact, that neighbors didn't even know he was living with his parents. As when he left the home, he would leave before dawn and return after dark. Nothing suspicious about that. That's super creepy. I don't see this going well, and I know what happens. Oh, well, did the fact that they found a bunch of dead bodies, or they found two chopped up dead bodies, give it away? (laughs) And it's his parents. And they died on Father's Day. (laughs) Yeah. There's a lot of things, a lot of foreboding things happening. Weird. After the bodies of Fred and Edwina were discovered, a search was launched for Charles, who was the prime suspect. However, he was never found, and the case went cold. In 1975, Charles Rogers was declared legally dead by a Houston judge. But the case still remains unsolved, as Charles was the only suspect. However, in more recent years, however, in more recent years, forensic accountant Hugh Gardner and his wife Martha have continued to investigate the case as armchair detectives. They concluded that the murder was in fact committed by Charles due to the evidence they discovered that suggested that Charles was abused by his parents from a very young age. Oh, geez. They believe that Charles had been planning his parents' murders for years due to the abuse and that both his parents were, quote, con artists. That kind of pertains to why he quit in 1957. Mm. Ah. They're thinking that that was around the time he started planning. Okay, so he didn't, he couldn't work because he had to put all his time and energy to his bed. Right. All right. Okay. They also discovered that the house that they lived in was not, in fact, his parents' house. The house was in Charles's name that he had purchased. It turns out that Charles's parents would constantly take loans out in their son's name, pretending to be him, oh, and then God. racking up tons of debt. What? This is what led to their murder. Dun, dun, dun. Big surprise. <laughs> Additionally, the Gardeners claim that Fred Rogers was a bookie who regularly participated in illegal activities and would steal large sums of money from his son. They believe that after Charles killed and dismembered his parents, he fled the United States to Mexico, which is the genuinely agreed upon theory due to his close proximity to Mexico. The Gardeners believe, however, that he ended up in Honduras, where he continued working as a geophysicist for various oil and mining companies. They believe that he was killed somewhere in Honduras. How can a judge legally declare someone dead? Yes, they can. In absentia, yeah. What does that mean? The person is gone. They're absent. They haven't turned up anywhere. So after a certain period of time, uh, usually it's done to unlock estates. Oh, okay. Mm. So, you know, if somebody is waiting on the money that's in your estate, Mm. but you're not technically dead... It can speed up that process when people think that, you know, most likely that you're dead. I mean, in in that case, he had been missing for 10 years already. Oh, okay. It's kind of like assumptions, but I mean, it kind of makes sense because where else would this person be if they weren't dead? Right. And if they're not dead, they're not showing up anywhere to take their stuff. So, What if they do? I assume there's some sort of legal proceedings. You'd probably have to talk with police. Yeah. Because you disappeared for X amount of years. Yes. It's not that easy to just like, I don't want to be Kim anymore. I'm going to be Charmaine. Like, you can't just... <laughs> and you would have to have, like, reasons why you weren't able to be found. Yeah. Like, right. And pretty much the only legal reason would be witness protection programs. Yes. So... <laughs> yeah. Or or kidnapped, <laughs> maybe. Right, right. You'd have to have, like... A crime know, was done, you know? Yeah. Um, but yes, yeah, so judges can... But again, it's, it's mostly just for uh, beneficiaries. This was one weird tidbit of information on Charles Rogers that I did find, however. Uh, Apparently, Charles is listed not only as the suspected murderer of his parents, but also of a United States president. What? Ooh. Apparently, in a 1992 book called The Man on the Grassy Knoll, which was written by John Craig and Philip Rogers who I assume is no relation. No, I don't think so. (laughs) Uh, It is claimed that Charles was a CIA agent 
who was one of the shooters of President John F. Kennedy. Oh, my God. Really? (laughs) They also alleged that Rogers ended up killing his family because his mother was, quote, tracking his many telephone calls. Stupid. Hmm. That's stupid. (laughs) Yeah, I'm not sure where this theory came from, but it seems a little weird to me. I mean, who knows? Uh, And maybe, you know, one day we'll do an episode on JFK's assassination. I don't know if we really want to dive into that sticky conspiracy web. Maybe, though. Conspiracy's fun. I feel like that'd be, like, a multiple part episode. I don't know if we could fit all of JFK into one. We could do, like, one episode on the actual murder Mm. and then another episode on the, you know, the murderer. Yeah, right. Cover all our bases. So this episode itself has a little twist. As the previous story was a little too short... I thought, why don't we cover another Icebox murder? Ooh. Okay. Well, technically, this is the story of the cold storage killer. Oh. I figured, you know, close enough. (laughs) Cold stuff in place. Stuff. (laughs) Surprisingly, there are a few refrigerator-related murders. (laughs) (laughs) I'm not that surprised, actually. No, me neither. And this one actually has a weird little connection to the previous story that I will discuss after. Okay. Uh, We're now going to jump into a more recent time instead of 1965, as in the previous case. On July 13th, 1994, amidst the laughter of children on a summer vacation and the sounds of bees buzzing in the hot summer air, a radio crackled and requested dispatch to visit a development for the Prescott Country Club in Dewey, Arizona. Deputy Joe. Good old Deputy Joe. (laughs) (laughs) Deputy Joe. Good old DJ. (laughs) DJ. Giacomo? (laughs) Why would you do this to yourself? I like like Deputy Joe. (laughs) Deputy (laughs) Joe. (laughs) I know, but I use his last name a lot. What? Did Joe? Twice. All right, so it's D I G I C O M O. Di Giacomo. I think it's Di Giacomo. I'm going to say Di Giacomo. I don't think that's what it is, but okay. He can call me. <laughs> Di Gimo? Di Gimo? Di Gimon. Di Gimon. It's, de- it's, it's Deputy Joe Di Gimon. All right. Yes. Deputy Joe Di Giacomo <laughs> <sighs> was sent to investigate a rental truck believed to have been stolen. Upon finding the truck, Di Giacomo noticed that there was an electrical cord which ran from the back of the truck to a nearby house on an adjacent property. Di Giacomo suspected that he may have stumbled into a meth lab, so he then contacted the narcotics department. When they arrived, the lock on the back of the truck was removed, and to everyone's surprise, they instead found several paint cans and a running freezer. Huh. The freezer was locked and sealed with masking tape. Again, not suspicious at all. (laughs) Upon opening the lid, the odor of decaying flesh overwhelmed the truck cargo bed. One of the detectives reached into the black plastic bag and felt what he thought was a human arm. Why would you just stick your hand in? I know. I I seriously hope that detective was wearing gloves because, wow, that would be gross. Ew! Oh my god. And like, why is he touching things in a possible crime scene? Yes! Mm-hmm. Why doesn't he have gloves on? And and the thing is, too, the second you smell decaying flesh, what are you like? Maybe it's a dog! And like, <laughs> what do you think is in there? It's just a bunch of gerbils! Like, yeah. no! And I'll be able to tell once I poke it. <laughs> yeah, right? let me just, let me just get in here and squeeze it around a little bit. <laughs> let me just put up my unkept hand on it. Yeah, great. Great idea. So from here... The investigators began by removing three layers of plastic bags to discover the freezer contained a handcuffed human body curled in the fetal position. The freezer also had a frozen layer of blood and bodily fluids. Ew. And the corpse's head was covered by another set of smaller white plastic bags. From here, the entire truck and freezer were transported to Arizona's state crime lab. The body was identified as being Denise Huber, a young woman who disappeared three years earlier from a Southern California freeway. Oh, jeez. Okay. At 5.30 p.m., the same day of the discovery, John Famalaro, accompanied by his mother, pulled up to his home 
where he was immediately arrested for the murder. Before we get into the investigation and trial, let's first learn a little bit more about Denise Huber and her murderer. Okay. This makes me feel bad things. Okay. This one's rough. Okay. Yeah. I mean, the first one was messed up. But it was short and it was just ended with the guy being dead. I mean. Yeah. But this one's rough. Okay. In the early mornings of Monday, June 3rd, 1991, Denise Huber drove from a Morrissey concert at the Los Angeles Forum towards Orange County. The last person to see her alive was a male friend who she dropped off after the concert at approximately 2 a.m. And from there, no one knew what happened to her. When she failed to return home later in the morning, Huber's parents began to panic and contacted friends for any clues on their daughter's whereabouts. Eventually, they contacted the police. Huber's best friend, Tammy Brown, began her own search for Denise and late Monday evening spotted her car on the shoulder of the 57 freeway. It had a flat tire and a dead battery, the result of the activation of the emergency flashers. Skid marks on the road indicated a blowout. Huber, her keys, and her purse were missing. There was no sign of blood, foul play, or any other damage to the automobile. The local police did an extensive search into her disappearance, and even a billboard was made featuring her photograph and a plea for help. Also, the news regularly would run interviews with her parents, who would share their story and ask for any shred of information. Ultimately, the case went cold and no leads were made, at least not until the discovery of her remains in 1994. Oh, that's so sad. On July 9th, 1994, Elaine Canalia and Jack Court were selling items from their paint distribution business in Arizona. Why does that matter? Well, because they happened to meet up with a contractor there named John Famolaro, who claimed to be selling excess paint from his contracting business. As they had seen him around and knew of him, they agreed. They followed him to his home in Dewey, Arizona, to pick up the product. However, when they arrived at the home, Canalia and Court realized that the backyard was full of hundreds of paint cans, which seems really great for the environment, by the way. What? Yeah, no. Uh -huh. no. <laughs> there was also a Ryder rental truck covered in a tarp. As though he was frantically trying to get rid of the product, Fumalaro hurriedly helped them to load the paint onto their truck, to the point where, once they were done, Canalia and Court agreed on how weird the whole situation had felt to them. It was evident that the rental truck had been there a long time, due to the debris surrounding it, and after the way Famolaro had been acting, Canalia wrote down the plate number and Ryder's serial number, because she's awesome. Well, thank God someone has a brain. Yep. Mm-hmm. Oh, my God. Three days later, Canalia passed this info down to the police, who confirmed that the truck was stolen from Southern California six months prior. After the discovery of the body and the subsequent arrest of Famolaro, police pressed for more information on the body that was discovered in his driveway, but Famolaro refused to provide any information. The police asked around for more info on him, and neighbors stated he was basically a recluse who would purposely avoid interaction, which doesn't necessarily mean anything, because some people are just like that. Suspicious, okay? though. Still suspicious. I know, some people just don't like people. Yeah, I don't know anyone like that. No, I've, no, I've never met someone Me like that before. <laughs> In fact, Famolaro would never discuss anything with the police, and he did not testify at his trial. Due to this, we don't know exactly what happened, but the police and prosecution were able to speculate what they believed to be as close to the truth as can be gleaned from the evidence. It appears that, while driving home, Denise's car tire blew out, and she activated her hazard lights and most likely got out of her car. It's believed that Famolaro saw her and pulled over to the side of the road. Now, near her car, no blood had been recovered, and Huber's body had no defensive wounds. So it's been theorized that Huber got into Famolaro's car willingly due to her car problems. Additionally, when investigating Famolaro's home once he had been arrested, police discovered two police uniforms in his possession. So they also have theorized that he may have pretended to be a member of law enforcement offering her a hand. Oh, good. Great. That makes me feel so much better about this whole situation. It happens. This is why I'm terrified to drive anywhere at night yeah. and the fear that my car breaks down and then I get literally kidnapped oh, and murdered. Right? Once in his vehicle, 
Femilaro almost immediately knocked her out and duct-taped her face and eyes and handcuffed her in case she awoke. From there, he drove to a storage unit that he had been renting at the time and dragged her unconscious body in. We have again uh, reached that part of every true crime story where I want to let you know that it's about to be bad. Okay, I'm ready. So here it is. Uh, if you're worried and you don't want to listen to it, you might want to hit that 30-second skip. <laughs> Once in the secluded storage unit, Fremilaro stripped off Huber's clothes, sodomized her, and then placed the three white plastic bags around her head, cinching them tightly closed. The plastic bags being added to the victim's head established Fremilaro's intent, showing he knew exactly how he would kill his victim and that he had a desire to minimize bleeding and blood spatter. He then took the claw hammer and bashed Huber repeatedly in a manner so ferocious that pieces of white plastic were found embedded in the cracks of her skull. Uh. Apparently as well, the plastic bags didn't do much to stop the mess, as there was evidence that the attack was incredibly violent and brutal strewn all over the storage unit. During the investigation, a witness at the storage unit facility had stated that the unit had to be cleaned when Femilaro moved out, and that one spot in particular was covered with what they thought was red paint. The police, suspecting that the red paint might have been Hoover's blood, removed the baseboards and found a significant amount of dried blood. So maybe I missed what you just said, but um, was she dead before he bashed her in the head? No, she wasn't. So she wasn't, she hadn't suffocated from the plastic bags? No. Oh, okay. That's what I was hoping happened because you didn't say it and now I'm sad. Okay. No. Okay. From what I found in my research, she died with the head. Wound. She was alive while that happened. Okay. Probably unconscious. Hopefully unconscious. I mean, maybe the sodomy would have woken her up. But she was still breathing. She was alive. She was alive. Okay. Okay. <laughs> After John Fumalaro's arrest, revelations about his childhood surfaced, and it appeared that he had grown up with a controlling and domineering mother who was deeply religious. This, of course, not to blame moms. But is a common similarity in a lot of killers, along with the quintessential, you know, violence to animals, incontinence, and head trauma. Um, apparently, it was so bad that the mother would actually dictate every single detail of her children's lives down to where they sat, creating seating assignments for family car trips or even while watching TV. What? Oh, my God. Yeah. There's control, and then there's control. Yeah. Wow. Okay. The Famolaro children rarely interacted with other children and were forbidden to invite other kids to their home. As her children grew up, their mother would listen in on their phone conversations, go through their possessions, and ban any contact with the opposite sex. Oh my god. Okay. Because that would make me want to talk to my mother. Yeah. Wow. Okay. <laughs> in fact, John wasn't the only one in his family with a troubling criminal record. As in 1980, John's brother Warren was convicted of child molestation and was sentenced to oh. five years in a state mental institution. Oh my God. As a mother, like, she has to know that's her fault. <sighs> I mean, who knows? But it she was with, with her son when he was arrested. When she was with John. Oh. If you remember me saying that earlier. Yes. Yeah. Even well into his, you know, I don't know how old he was when they took him, I think like in his 40s. So even well into his life. He was still spending all of his time with his mother. Maybe he even lived with her still. Wow. Okay. Additionally, some things started coming out about John during his trial that bore startling resemblance to the murder of Denise Huber. For example, testimony from an ex named Darlene Miller showed a history of aggressive and inappropriate behavior towards women. During a holiday trip with John, Miller was shocked when suddenly, during a romantic moment together, and without her consent, Famolaro snapped on a pair of handcuffs, attaching her to a metal bar near the window. He then stripped her, left the curtains open, and left her there for several hours. What? What? I'm assuming that's why they broke up. <laughs> <laughs> he apparently then went to go watch the show that they were supposed to go see together by himself. Oh my, oh my god. She was in full view of the public in that window. So could people see her? Yes. Oh my god. Yeah. Did she like ask for help when they saw like her? screaming or something? 
She was still there when he returned. <gasps> and he couldn't stop thinking, couldn't stop talking about how much of a clever, practical joke he had played on her. Oh, no. No, 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 I no, really no. hope that was the end of their relationship. <sighs> Miller played along until she returned home where she severed all ties with him. Oh, thank God. <laughs> okay. Oh, thank God. But she still had to at least, I mean, they were out of town together. She still had to at least pretend. And she had ha -ha. to travel back with him. Yeah. Oh, my ha -ha. God. Yeah, that was a great joke. But that was so much fun for me. Thank you. I loved when you stripped me naked and left me in front of a window. A for all handcuffed. <laughs> handcuffed to it. So I couldn't even yeah. go to the bathroom or... And then you went to go do that thing we were supposed to do together. Great date night, honey. And then treated it like a joke. Uh, yep. Ooh, absolutely not. Okay. A year after the incident with Miller that I had just mentioned, Famolaro became involved with another woman named Kate Colby. And things progressed to a point where the couple actually discussed marriage. But an incident, again involving handcuffs, in which Famolaro attempted to force himself upon her sexually after she repeatedly told him no, was the first red flag in another tumultuous on-again, off-again romance. Eventually, however, Colby broke off the relationship permanently. Overall, there was a definite pattern that formed, especially with the inclusion of the handcuffs. Uh, I don't know what to say. I don't. Really? If you remember, uh, Huber's corpse was found with handcuffs. With handcuffs. I just, in these types of situations with like all these um, different partners of these serial killers, these, you know, killers in general. Yeah. I wish they would all just get together and have like a nice chat <laughs> and be like, what happened to you while you were dating so-and-so? Just like a roast session. You know, and be like, he was so terrible in bed or something. I think it should happen in the courtroom. Right? Yes. Just get them all together and be like, this is what we all know about him. And it's all terrible and it's all the same. Judge Judy presiding. It would be so fun. I don't know. That would be so exciting. I just wish that would, I, obviously. It would never I mean, happen. But. I guess technically that is what happened because these were court testimonies that they received these stories from. Oh, oh, that's kind of fun then. Yeah, they asked these exes to come and... Okay, that's kind of fun. Okay, then I'm, I'm happy that actually happened. All right, cool. <laughs> Although Famolaro's defense attorneys introduced testimony that he was bullied as a child and molested by his brother, the judge was unmoved. Because an allegation of sodomy combined with murder qualified as a, quote, special circumstance under California law, Famolaro faced the death penalty. So apparently, I don't know if this has since changed... But in California law, if you murder someone and sodomize them, you automatic death penalty. Wow. I don't know if... If that still stands. But... Right. Because I think a lot of laws on sodomy have considerably changed, but... That's really, like, bold. Wow. And kind of... I, I, I don't know how I feel about Inappropriate? it. Inappropriate? Like, you know, that's probably... That's probably for men. Exactly. Interesting. I'm assuming that would have been changed by now. I mean, probably Maybe. in California, but I know in other countries, or Con other, other countries, other states. other states, I'm sure, like, it's still illegal. On May 22nd, 1997, the jury in John Famolaro's case convicted him of murder, sodomy, and kidnapping after de deliberating for only five hours. He was formally sentenced to death on September 6th, 1997. However, after a hold that was placed in 2006... Capital punishment was essentially stopped in California due to a judge's ruling that lethal injection could cause inhumane suffering. Okay. In a recent article from the LA Times, Denise Huber's parents spoke about their life after their daughter's death and about her murderer. They are both in their 70s now and believe that they will die before her killer does. In a frustrating detail, the police, while investigating Famolaro's home, found newspaper, newspaper articles about the disappearance, and he had even taped a recording of a television appearance her parents had done, asking for her whereabouts. Oh my god. Oh my god. Her mother stated, quote, to be so cruel and so cold that he let us suffer like that. She was unable to finish her statement. And that is the second Icebox Killer. Different, but still a monster. Okay, that one was way worse. Yeah. That yeah. one was rough. So, oh. quick quiz before we move on to discussion. Okay. Did you guys catch the similarity other than the refrigerator thing? The religious parents? No. No, because um, no. the Rogers weren't religious. They were oh, con okay. artists. Just bad people? Yeah. Just bad people, yeah. Okay. Um, no. Both John Famolaro 
and Charles Rogers used claw hammers. I yeah. Oh, I was going to say the weapons okay. before you said it. I was like, ah, never mind. You know, you when you said claw hammer in the second one, I'm like, did she say claw hammer in the first? I did. And the second one, that's why I went, ah, and I went, ah. Yep. Denise Huber was killed with a claw hammer. The weapon. And so was Charles Rogers' father, Frederick. Yes. Damn it. Ugh. Doesn't have anything to do with anything, but I no. definitely thought that was an interesting comparison considering, you know, they both decided to put their murder in their ice box in yeah ice box and refrigerators well, did we ever find out what he was gonna do with the body uh no because we or never did he just not know what to do with it oh because he wouldn't talk about it he wouldn't talk about it right yeah he never he never talked oh. about what he was gonna do or what any about it because it had been in there for what three years at that point yeah. and they found it did he just like not know what to do with it well they had mentioned also when they were i mean there were all those paint cans and everything and when they went in the house there there was signs that he was potentially a hoarder. Mm-hmm. I was gonna say, are the uh, all the paint cans were they full of paint? He he was a contractor. Oh, okay. Oh, true, true. Okay, okay. Right, okay. but that's why they thought that it was red paint was because he was a contractor. Okay, I guess I missed that little. Oh, can you imagine being the person to have to clean that? Oh my god, I know. Well, and I think they just I think they probably just painted over because they thought it was red paint. But can you imagine like in after yeah. like knowing. Mm-hmm. afterwards being like oh we just covered up a murder yeah that was that was blood all over the floor interesting <laughs> they probably called the cops for every stain that ever was in anything <laughs> right? after that like sir this is blue <laughs> this isn't blood somebody spilled a coke in the yeah. corner and now i need to check it sir this is an unopened can of sprite <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, so real quick, uh, I just want to do my sources. I used Wikipedia, um, All That's Interesting, uh, Murderpedia. Ranker did really good coverage of Denise Huber's murder. And finally, um, the LA Times article, which was the one that interviewed uh, her parents. Which is so, which is probably the saddest part of everything. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I mean, he's in prison, but still. So he's still alive today. Yep. Bastard. He she is. just had car trouble. Right? Like- her car just broke. That was the only thing she did. Yeah. Something completely out of her control. She was just in the wrong wrong place, wrong time. Yep. All right. Well, do you guys have any other discussions you want to talk about for this? Oof. Yep. It's tough. So, yeah. Those are the Icebox murders. And, and now, Allie, why don't you tell us how refrigerators work now that we know what you can put in them? <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay. So... Refrigerators are commonly attached to a freezer. No, I don't understand. Um, I don't understand. Can you explain no? that? Okay. I don't understand what that means. So sometimes, sometimes there's only one thing that you plug into the wall. Okay. But part of it is a refrigerator. Okay. Huh. And part of it's a freezer. What? <laughs> yeah, it's crazy. So they come in all shapes and sizes. So there's some with one doors and some with two doors fun fact we had to buy a two-door refrigerator because my dog could open the one-door refrigerator and would help himself interesting yes lovely jackson <laughs> i can just visualize Me you too. rolling your eyes while doing this research being like god damn it kim <laughs> <laughs> well so like the history of refrigerators i'm like okay we can get into this and then we got to the science of it and it is so dumbed down with like because I had to read it five or six times to figure out, like, the mechanics of it. Yeah. And, like, because it vaporizes, like, five times in, like, five different cooling tanks. Whoa. <laughs> it's very, very, very detailed. Weird. So it's going to be, like, a very brief overview okay. of what happens. Like, <laughs> huh. okay. because I couldn't really get all of it in without people literally just tuning me out. That's fair. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Like, there's only so much scientific jargon that you can put in things before it just becomes illegible. Yeah, oh yeah. No, I hear you. Okay, back to refrigerators? Oh, please. (laughs) Okay. So, the freezer can be above or below the refrigerator. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, my God. Okay. Woo! There are generally shelves and drawers inside. I didn't know what to say, okay? <laughs> <laughs> I gotta stop giving you these stupid topics right? to try to do. This uh, is like the description of chess things. <laughs> I'm like, I don't know how to, I don't know what to say. Okay, right, sorry, um, I'm sorry, go ahead. There, so, okay. so there's shelves. Yes, you put food on them and or body parts. Um, And then there's drawers inside. They kept the heads in. Oh, 
god. In that first one. Heads of lettuce. <laughs> Heads of lettuce, uh-huh, yes. Uh-huh. The vegetable crisper. And parents. <laughs> <laughs> and parents. It's basically made of two parts. In a thermally insulated base, which is where you keep the food and bodies. <laughs> and then a heat pump. Uh-huh. So the first refrigerator made without just sticking ice inside of or an insulated space was <laughs> made in the 1750s. Oh, wow. Um, but it wasn't actually, like, developed until the 1800s. So the first commercial refrigeration unit was made in 1834. And the first one made for, like, the average person in a home was invented in 1913. Oh, wow. So just over, yeah, so just over 100 years ago. Oh, okay. So, like, just think of how old we are, how old our parents are, how old our grandparents are. Right. Our great-grandparents probably didn't have refrigerators. I definitely yeah. thought refrigerators were not that new. <laughs> yeah, right? Like, I don't know. It's just crazy to think about. Um, so the actual cooling of a refrigerator uses a vapor compression cycle, which is a closed-circuit unit with a coolant inside. Um, so the refrigerant, the refrigerant undergoes vaporization in multiple sets of coils. The vaporization absorbs heat, causing the areas around it to cool. The cool air is then pumped into the thermally insulated space Mm -hmm. where the food is stored. So that's a really, really, really dumbed down version of it. Okay. But basically, when um, refrigerant vaporizes, it absorbs heat and leaves cold air behind. And we're not going to get into if cold is actually a thing or, or if it's just the absence of heat. Okay. All right. But yeah. Awesome. Well, thank you very much. Um, I did not actually know that refrigerators had shelves. So. <laughs> what about the crispers? That I knew. Oh, okay. Yeah, because we put heads in those. Yeah. Only crispers, though. I didn't know anything about Only the shelves. Only crispers. Yep. Yes. Yeah. What about how many different doors or the location of the freezer? Well, you know what? The different <laughs> doors thing totally just blew my mind away. Killed me. Right? Yep. So if there's one door, Jackson can open it and only eat stuff off the bottom shelf, even though he's eye level with the top shelf. But if there are Weird. two, he doesn't have any hands. Yes. Okay, so I think we could just skip over the discussion of the science portion. <laughs> I think it was pretty well handled. Oh, yes. Uh, <laughs> well, in that case, then, uh, why don't we move on to Bitch Banter? Uh-huh. All right. So for this week's Bitch Banter, how exciting. Um... <laughs> It doesn't really have anything to do with this story. Sometimes the bitch banners do come like full circle, but I don't know if this one is going to at all. All right. So (laughs) this bitch banter is titled Lincoln, the goat elected mayor of small Vermont town. That sounds like Vermont. (laughs) (laughs) Yep. All right. So in Fairhaven, Vermont, a three-year-old Nubian goat named Lincoln is poised to become the first honorary pet mayor of the small Vermont town of Fairhaven. Oh, pet mayor. I know. I thought that he was actually going to, like, oh. have things to say and give his opinions. Ugh. Also, it's a Nubian goat? It's a Nubian yes. goat. That's important. It is very important. How patronizing of them. <laughs> oh! <laughs> I see you. The nanny goat was chosen this week by townspeople for the one-year post at the community's town meeting day. Lincoln takes office Tuesday. Really? They couldn't do that on a weekend? I'm not sure. Just gonna they had fit to fit that to- in on a Tuesday? <laughs> They had to make him wait a couple days. Uh, The ballot of 16 pets was open to all town residents. Most of the other candidates were dogs and cats, and a gerbil named Crystal was also a candidate. (laughs) Crystal, that one's for you. Lincoln, with 13 votes, beat out a dog named Sammy that received 10 votes, and the other candidates combined for 30 votes. This is newsworthy? This is newsworthy. I mean, it's it's Vermont. What's going on there? It's 13 votes. I... (laughs) Is there crime in this city? I would hope not, because what are the elected officials doing? They are electing more officials. So this, um, this took place. It was March 7th. And during its time as mayor, Lincoln, (laughs) Lincoln will be expected to attend local events, such as marching in the Memorial Day parade, wearing a costume made sash. I don't think the goat has any say in that whatsoever. (laughs) Oh, and to answer your question, Fairhaven is a town of about 2,500 people. That's still... I'm disappointed with that turnout. And this border, it borders New York. So 
Why are we not just going to New York for fun things? I don't know. Just west of Rutland, New York is where they are, does oh. not have a human mayor. Oh my God. <laughs> so to continue this story, town manager Joseph Gunter said he heard about a small town in northern Michigan trying something similar, and he thought it would be a good way to raise money for a local pr playground. It only raised about $100 <laughs> through a $5 entry fee. How much How much did it cost them? I don't know. <laughs> the $100 literally just covers the fucking sash that they make the stupid goat wear. <laughs> um, so, town manager said this. It was a great way to introduce the elementary school kids to local government. Through a okay. goat mayor. To local go govern goat. <laughs> Go goat mint mint. So the last part of this is the balloting for pet mayor was held alongside the regular town meeting day vote, but any town <laughs> resident could vote. Made sure they voted on the <coughs> ballot. <laughs> <laughs> that was good. That was good. Thanks. Uh, I got at least one good one. In. And uh, that's that's bitch banter for this week. Oh God, goat jokes. <laughs> I hope you all enjoyed the goat jokes. <laughs> Uh, so anytime you have a goat, a pet goat, just, you know, run it for mayor. Maybe it'll win. Or send us pictures of it. I love goats. That's true. Send us pictures. That's true. Send us pictures of your he-goat. Of your he-goat. You need to praise him. Praise Satan, he-goat. Oh, also, you have to praise your he-goats. Yes. <laughs> also the she-goats. I want to see the she-goats, too. Well, I mean, if we're being inclusive, yes. The she-goats, of course. Of course, yes. So, yeah, that was bitch banter. I think I'm most <laughs> upset at that town in Vermont. <laughs> Fairhaven. Let's never visit there. Never visit I want to visit even. there. I'm trying really hard to come up with a pun and I'm not doing a good job. It's okay. It might come to you later. It's okay. No, something for election. Something that goes with elections. Elections. It's in Fair Haven. You know, like hay, like for cows. No, no, you're not good at this. No. no. I'm bad at this. <laughs> <laughs> no, we both, we both agree. No, no. I was gonna say next year as a as a podcast trip we should go to Fairhaven, to Fairhaven <laughs> Vermont, yes. and for visit the, the mayor for the preliminaries. <laughs> Let's go for Memorial Day so we can see where it's sash. <laughs> oh God! I want them to give me the hundred dollars. Oh my and I God! I know sash. I can't get over that that they raised a hundred dollars and the entry fee was five, so they raised like nothing. <laughs> <laughs> Why did they, they probably they <laughs> spent more money, more money on like putting out that they needed money? <laughs> they would have made more money off a goddamn bake sale. <laughs> I uh, I hate that story. <laughs> <laughs> so I hope you enjoyed that. I hope yep. that was fun for you. It was fun for us. If you couldn't tell, I'm a little disappointed in Vermont. <laughs> and uh, that, oh, and I got that article from Huff Post. Uh, of course you did. So, oh, I didn't. I got all my stuff from Wikipedia. All right. Well, uh, thank you guys so much for listening. I hope you enjoyed this uh, interesting episode. Yes. It's been a ride. It has been a ride. It was crazy and then really sad and then uh, very educational. <laughs> and it's kind of dumb. I and, mean, then, and, then it, now, and then it goats no. for mayor. So, <laughs> goat mayor. <laughs> So, yeah. uh, if you enjoyed us, please consider a following on Twitter at Death Dames Pod and on Instagram at Death Dames Podcast, where we post pictures from the stories we cover. And yes, of course, we'll be posting pictures of the goat mare. I know you all want to see. Uh, we also have a Facebook page, which you can check out and give us a like there as well. Uh, and also, we are looking for any science, history, or true crime stories. Please email them to us at deathdamespodcast at gmail.com. Also, if you liked this and want to hear more, please consider subscribing or following, leave a comment, rate and review, and share with anyone you think would like our weird podcast. Remember, smart is sexy. Bye. 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 Vote for me. That was the goat mare. <laughs>